Good day, and how in the heck are you? My name is Al Weissman, and I want to welcome you to the latest and greatest installment of the In a Nutshell TV show. Today, we have the great good fortune to have visiting with us in the studio Pamela Enzweiler Police, documentarian for the Dick Biondi film, which is a work in progress. Just to inform some of our viewers who may not be familiar with Dick Biondi, he was a disc jockey f uh, during the period from about the late 1950s until about 2018, wasn't it? Just about a year ago? Two uh, years ago? Was it a year ago that he left the era? It might have been last spring or the spring before. I, okay. Sorry. Well, in any event, he retired in the last year or two. Mr. Biondi is still alive and living with his wife in the Chicago area. Uh, during his career, he is responsible for some lofty attainments, including he was fired from 25 jobs as a disc jockey for essentially pushing the envelope, would you say? <laughs> That's a good way to put it. He didn't call himself the Wild Eye Trillion for nothing. He was the first disc jockey in the United States to play a Beatles tune, and he was in the studio when the Rolling Stones were recording Satisfaction. Pam, I remember when I was a kid listening to WLS, Prairie Farmer, believe it or not. I do too. I have a recollection, and I can't, you know, even as a kid, I remember, why am I listening to the Prairie Farmer? Me too. We lived in Chicago. My dad was a lawyer. He worked out. We had no contact with country life at all. Yeah. And there we were listening to the Prairie Farmer. What else was there to listen to? <laughs> <laughs> they probably asked themselves the same question, because at some point in time, I remember all of a sudden, everything changed on the radio station. I, I didn't know whether to feel disappointed or happy because I remember I, I mean you don't know what's coming next so you know what you had before kind of a thing hmm. but I was thrilled <laughs> <laughs> I remember it well I oh, remember go ahead. the first time that I I tuned I actually was tuning into the WLS Prairie Farmer and it was in the morning and it was in the spring of 1960 and uh, I thought I was going to hear some old you know Prairie Farmer stuff you know the farm report and I'll be darned if I'm not hearing rock and roll. And I'm like, what? what is this? <laughs> so I end up uh, later, of course, hearing Dick Biondi, and the rest is history. I mean, I was hooked. There you so, go. So, yeah, I remember it well. I, w I was a f kind of a fan of Pat Buttram. You know, he was one of yeah. the announcers on the Prairie sure. Farm Show. Sure. We all love Pat. On, especially on the Roy Rogers Show. Oh, yeah. But, uh, but then, actually, after I listened to the new music on WLS, it, I really liked that a lot. Mm -hmm. And that's what I grew up with. That's what we all grew up yeah. with. And uh, so now, when did you start working on the Dick Biondi project? I think it was back in 1962 when I met Dick, and I was instantly <laughs> I said I thought. hooked. I had an idea it was going to be something <laughs> Isn't like that. that. Crazy, <laughs> honest to God, I really, I actually just realized not that long ago that I probably have been wanting to do this my whole life. Because I've kept a file ca uh, in my file cabinet, I always had a file folder with Dick Biondi stuff in it, news <laughs> clippings, little mementos, you know, little notes about things, and I just have had that my whole life. Wow, it's crazy, isn't it? But I, it wasn't until I retired that I actually had the time to do it. Because up until then, I was pretty much working, you know, and taking <clears throat> care of my mom. She was in, uh, she lived with me, my elderly mom, and then when she died. I had the time. I suddenly had a lot of time on my hands, and I thought, you know, maybe, maybe I could ask Dick about this. And I did. Did, did you ask him? I did. Uh, first, I asked him. I said, uh, Dick, because I was doing these little video memoirs, and I actually shared them with Dick, and he said he loved them. And so I, a light bulb goes on, and I'm like, hmm, I wonder if I could do Dick's story. But it's a huge. It was a huge undertaking. I said, oh, I don't know. I was used to doing videos, you know, little small videos for people. Mm -hmm. I actually had my own video production business for about mm, eight or nine years. And I learned how to do it, and I loved it, just like what Dolores is doing. And um, so, but doing a full-blown documentary, especially about an icon like Dick Biondi, is a whole other realm. So I just didn't know if I had it in me, you know, I didn't know, because I knew I'd have to put myself out there in the world. And I was kind of shy about it, you know. I was kind of hiding myself, to be honest. And, um, but when I, I met a friend, she was a filmmaker. And she said, and I showed her my work, and she said, when I told her my secret one day, my secret dream, how I always wanted to do Dick's story, she said, Pam, you can do it. 
and I, I really didn't believe her, but I, it kept, you know, kind of, in my mind, I kept thinking. So when I asked Dick, has anybody ever approached you about doing a documentary? And he said, yes, I'm actually talking to somebody. So I let it go, and about a year later, I asked him again, what, whatever happened with that documentary? And he said, nothing really. And, I, and then I was like, oh, I got to ask him. <laughs> and I tell you what, I just figured, at my age, I had lived my whole life. I had done all the things I thought I was going to do. I was retired. I thought that was it for me. So I thought, what the heck? I might as well give it a try. What have I got to lose? Maybe I'll fail. So I went for it. And I um, started, I asked Dick. I got the nerve up to ask Dick one day. Finally, I just blurted it out. I said, what I told him was really the truth. I said, you know, Dick, I was on your Facebook page today, and I was looking at all of the old rock and roll days, you know, went back in WLS and all the artists that you worked with and your fellow DJs and all those wonderful WLS memories. And I said, you know, I was there with you. I was with you at the Sock Hops. I was with you at the WLS studios on Saturday and with all the fans. And, and I had a fan club for him. So I, I kind of was always going where he was going as much as I could. And he said, yeah. I said, you know, I, I would love to tell your story. And, you know, I guess I sold him because he said yes. And I was like, did you just say yes? <laughs> so How it was cool a shock. Yeah, yeah, it was amazing. And it's been, what a journey. He oh said my gosh. yes. And he did agree to give me uh, access to his sock hops and his car shows and some of his personal appearances and um, interviews. We did a couple interviews up at the WLS studios um, before they moved to the new NBC building, the old studios on State Street. And, um, you know, I had a lot of access. Cool. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Now, this memorabilia that you saved over the years, have you been able to incorporate any of it into the movie? Well, I have Dick's album, you know, his teenage album. I should have brought it along. <laughs> um, we're going to talk about that. In fact, we're working on that right now. That, you know, we started this project in 2014, and we captured all these interviews with all these different people, artists, music artists, and DJs, and people in the business, the radio business, and fans, friends of Dick's. And now we're putting it together. The movie is coming together, and we're actually at that scene now where we're talking about this album that Dick has that he recorded for the Teenagers of America. Does it have anything on it other than the pizza song? Oh yeah, it's got a lot of little poems and little stories and you know, music. And, really? and Dick is telling stories about some of his experiences as a disc jockey and talks about teenagers a lot because he loves teenagers. He, well, we're old teenagers now, but he still loves us. <laughs> But yeah, it's a great album, really. It's, it's different. It's very different. You know, it, it doesn't have like, m you know, music on it, like songs on it, other than the pizza song and the knock knock song. I think it, that's on there. But it doesn't have, um, you know, like pop songs or anything. It's just Dick talking and telling stories about, you know, and dedicating it to the teenagers. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, over the past several years since Dolores and I, by the way, Dolores is my wonderful wife and our, the videographer for this show. <laughs> and she's been working extremely diligently, continuously, and producing wonderful shows since we've been on commercial television, and even before then when we were on public access TV. That's right, and everybody knows Dolores. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I've seen you call upon an amazing assortment of resources and, since we've been friends and in the process of putting this movie together. I've seen you do shots at Super Dogs and on the northwest side of, of, uh, of Chicago, that's where Super Dogs is, uh, calling upon a classic car club to provide vintage cars. Yeah, the Lamont Classic Car Club. They caravaned out to the Super Dog. We took over the Super Dog one whole night. We got permission and uh, it was wonderful. We had teenagers, all kinds of young, talented kids that came out and volunteered dressed up like they were from the 50s and 60s and how cool it was just awesome well you were there yeah <laughs> you place, and Dolores I, I, I'm sure that that place looks essentially like it did back then yeah I think it does with the big hot dogs out standing up yeah, there and yeah. we had all those beautiful cars just cruising in and out of the drive-in and all the kids were hanging out and it was great 
It was, it was cool. It was a memorable evening. I've seen you shoot scenes in the country using uh, <laughs> older and newer cars <laughs> uh, to make certain points. And in, the, in one of those scenes, Dolores and I actually acted. Well, if you can call it acting, I mean, you know. That's right. You did a reenactment for us. And there you go. And it's awesome. Wait till you guys see this. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's going to be near the end of the film, and it's... Uh, it's done in a, uh, what year uh, T-Bird was that? I don't remember. It was a beautiful. It was like a 58 T-Bird, something Oh, like it was that. a beautiful convertible T-Bird. And uh, we had a, a couple of our uh, young actors in there. And uh, it's going to be really cool. But if our scene does anything to negatively affect your movie, please, you, can, you feel oh, free I to will. I'll take cut it, it right out. Don't worry about it. Okay. We've already, we know it's going to work. Oh, okay. That's great. <laughs> I know you've interviewed many former radio personalities from WLS and probably other stations as well. That's yep. a lot of work. That's oh, a yeah. lot of work. Oh, yeah. It's been huge. Well, Dick gave me a list of people to interview, too. Oh, he did? He did. And I tried to get, I've got most of them, to tell you the truth. We traveled around the country a little bit. We had help from a lot of people to make this movie. I mean, it's incredible, the support that I've had. Um, People have, you know, I had um, Art Volo, radio's best friend, he's known as. I interviewed him. And I know you interviewed um, rock and roll stars who were given a shove by Dick Biondi to help kickstart their careers. Mm -hmm. And how many were there? There must have been an awful lot of those guys. We, we've got, well, I don't know how many of those guys. I mean, we, there's a lot. But Ronnie we've got, Rice. Yeah, Ronnie, Ronnie Rice. Jimmy N Sun. NC6, Crying Shame. Yeah. Ray Graffia. Oh, yeah, there's so many more. Frankie Valley, uh, Brian Wilson, and Al Jardine from the Beach Boys. Tony Orlando. Tony Orlando. Um, Bobby Rydell, Frankie Avalon. I mean, it's just, there's so many. Um, Tom Dreesen, the comedian. Jim Peterick. Paul, yeah, Jim Peterick, absolutely awesome. Um, Paul Schaefer from the David Letterman show. I mean, there's just, so many great people that are part of this, and they're all huge Biondi fans. What does uh, Paul Schaefer have to do with Dick Biondi? Well, you know, I had heard him talk about Dick Biondi on the Letterman show, and I knew he was a huge fan. Oh, yeah, and okay. Letterman is too, because Letterman, you know, grew up in Indiana. He used to, he grew up listening to Dick go. Biondi, okay. and Paul Schaefer grew up listening to Dick Biondi up in Canada. Wow! Because the fifty thousand watt signal would fly up there, and he said it was. He said it was unbelievable. He said you would be turning the dial and you'd hear that voice and you had to go back. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Now, did you contact any of the folks at any of the radio stations, any of the 25 radio stations from which he was yes, fired? Yes, yes, I have. I've got great stories. I bet. I've got a few good stories. You know, there's not too many of Dick's bosses around anymore. So, um, I, but we have one boss for sure. Well, a couple bosses have a few good stories so yeah <laughs> I also know that for a while you were covering the, ex the production expenses out of your own pocket yeah I was up yeah. until recently as a matter of fact um, then I started getting some help this wonderful gift came to me this young man named Joe Farina I was gonna ask you about Joe yeah Joe oh my goodness I met Joe at a Dennis Stefano concert uh, Phyllis Baziri who's a good friend of ours she and I went to this concert, and uh, we happened to meet. Um, um, De um, Joe was there, and uh, he, he said to me, well, somehow he got my number. I, I don't know, maybe from Phyllis. I, I don't know. But he called me up, and he said, you know, I'm really fascinated by your project, and I really would love to be part of it. And I was like, hmm, okay. So we met for coffee, and I'm telling you, he just offered to help me, you know, just out of the goodness of his heart. And he was instrumental in, I, I, he helped me get sponsors for the film. He also, you know, we just had our recent fundraiser, Good Times Rock and Roll fundraiser at the 115 Bourbon Street in Marionette Park. April 28th. Yes, and it was unbelievable, successful. It was just fabulous. And Joe took, he actually single-handedly rounded up all the silent auction gifts. Oh my goodness. And live auction gifts. Wow. And uh, he was incredible. I mean, he, that was a lot of work. We got, there were so many fascinating 
you know, gifts that we got, donations from famous people, uh, you know, celebrities, artists. I know you had signed guitars and stuff like that. Jim Peterick donated um, this beautiful guitar, and it was autographed by all of the Cornerstones of Rock artists. Wow. And the band Chicago donated a Chica autographed sh um, guitar. And uh, the Buckinghams, Carl Gemarisi donated an autographed guitar. How nice. And um, Paul Schaefer donated uh, his late night with David Letterman jacket <laughs> and his spectacles. <laughs> and Tony Orlando oh, cool. donated a tuxedo that he had worn. Wow. And yeah, it was just great. And a lot of other stuff, you know, too, way too many to name. <laughs> That's great. So yeah. How wonderful. So Joe was just instrumental in helping me. But he spent a lot of time with me, and I, I can't thank him enough. And uh, Joe, Joe Farina is Dennis Farina's son. Dennis Farina's son, actor, the actor, yeah. 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 Well, that, Joe's an and actor, Joe's too. And Joe's an actor, too. Oh, sure. Absolutely. So the fundraiser featured Jim Peterick. The Ides of March, mm -hmm. and 38 Special, formerly of Survivor. He was there. He was, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> I uh, I was going around collecting signatures for authorizations, and I walk into the green room. They called it the green room, but it was pitch black in this room. I couldn't see at anything. The, at the Good Times event? Yes. It was pitch black? Absolutely. And uh, I, I, walk I didn't in, even go in there. I was so busy that day. <laughs> I walk into the room, and here's a, a guy with a guitar. So I said, here, would you sign this, please? <laughs> And uh, so he says, sure, sure, you know. And I leave, and uh, I went over to uh, Scott, Scott and May, and I said, who was in the, in the room over there? He says, that was Jim Peterick. I said, you're kidding me. You know Jim. <laughs> of course. Well, I couldn't see but you couldn't in the see dark. Him. Oh, I look my at goodness. The, I look at the paper, you know, Jim Peterick. So I went back in there, and I said, Jim, I am so sorry. <laughs> I did not know it was you. It oh. was uh, he was a nice fellow. He's such a nice guy. Yeah, so talented. And uh, you had the uh, New Colony Six showed up. They were our headliners. With the uh, with Ray Graffia was there, the, Ray one Graffia. of the founding fathers of the New Absolutely. Colony Six. Absolutely, what a sweetheart of a guy. And then also present were the fantastic Southside Exiles, Dean Milano's Hundred Dollar Quartet, yep. Bagshot Row and Tony Bicek and the Meteor. So there's a lot of talent that was up on that stage that that's day. Right. And Jay and the Americans. And Jay was there from Jay and the Americans. That's right, Jay Reinke. Yeah, so that was one heck of a concert. And Carl Gemarisi and, and that's right. Dennis Tufano came in, sure. flew in from California. And you know, you don't often see uh, Dennis and Carl performing together. This was a rare treat. I mean, it really was, it was incredible. And the audience was just going wild over them. All of them. I mean, it was the show was phenomenal. You know, I've had people calling it the event of the year, and they're saying, "When are we going to do it again?" And and Scott something. McKay, oh, our DJ, fantastic from ninety five point nine The River. What a job! What a job he did. He is amazing. You know, he's in our film too. Oh, good. He actually opens oh, nice. up the film because he's introducing Dick on stage oh, at the Arcata nice. Theater. Oh, cool. Yeah. Is that from? Ron Onesti came. Is that from the original uh, Cornerstones when he introduced D uh, Dick Biondi? Uh, no, Marty, yes. Marty Greb. Oh, the Mar Marty Greb concert. The Marty Greb concert. Okay. Yeah, but those guys were there. Sure. So yeah, it was it was really special, and uh, you know Bob Surratt even came out for yes, our Good Times did. event. Sure. What a what a nice surprise. There were a lot of interesting people there. Yeah. Yeah, and B.B. King's daughter Shirley King was there. That's right. She showed up. Shirley King. And yeah. you know Carl Bonafetti. Yes. The screaming wild man who right. used to be the Buckingham's manager. Right. He came. Right, right. Yeah. It was very cool. Very, 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 cool, very cool event. Cool. Yes, he did a heck of a job. I'm telling you, I was just like blown away. I, I really was. And we had the most wonderful volunteers. We had a team of about 35 people. And a couple of people were helping me, you know, like I had never done a fundraiser. So... I was kind of learning. <laughs> and uh, Susan Rackus, who is the uh, manager of the Buckinghams, she also works for the Girl Scouts. She's an amazing woman. I mean, she's, I don't know how she does everything she does. Super, super nice gal. She was in charge of all the volunteers. And then a little gal named Carolyn Wheeler, who happens to be an inch shorter than me. 
<laughs> and that is short. <laughs> Nobody's shorter than me, except kindergartners, you know? <laughs> but Carolyn was like a little dynamo. I mean, she was everywhere. And you she had really a good helped group me out. There, man. And then, you know, Jean Milano was my stage manager. And oh my gosh, who else was? And Joe, of course, Joe Farina was in charge of the silent and the live auction. And Scott McKay helped with that too. And uh, we raised some money, and we were, that's why we're able to keep going editing now. My editor, Steve, and I are able to actually focus on putting this movie together now. Because usually we just kind of do it piecemeal, because, you know, we don't really have a lot of money, so we kind of do a little bit here, a little bit there. And now we've actually been able to work on it for the last, ever since the fundraiser, we've been working on it. Um, so we're a lot further down the road, and we figure we're going to get this story done this year. We, that's our plan. We hope so. I remember at one point in time you mentioned that you were really concerned about having music in this movie because of expenses involved Very expensive. and so forth. But I was wondering now that Peter X involved and NC Six is involved and all these other musicians, mm -hmm. if do you think that you'll be able to use some of their music? They in the have movie? given me permission to oh, use cool. one of their songs. Um, it started with the band Chicago. They offered uh, us a choice of one of their songs. How cool 30 is that? seconds. That is a big deal because that costs a lot of money. And uh, Jim Peterick followed up and Ray Graffia and Ronnie Rice and, you know, we're just going down the line. Tony Orlando allowed us to use a song. Wow. Yeah. So we've got a bunch of music so far, but we have a lot more to go. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. I'm so happy to yeah. hear that for so, you. So I don't know about using more original music. We don't know yet. but Because um, those guys were around back in those days, and that yes, music was were. around back in those days. Yes, they you were. You can't get much more authentic than that. Oh, I know. And we're actually to the point now where we're starting to edit that, that WCFL sequence where all Dick introduced all these bands. We're finally to that stage. Wow. So it's very exciting. Very cool. Yeah. So what comes next? We're just going to keep going, Steve and I. My editor, Steve Zagata, he's fantastic. What a guy. Um, Video Active Productions is the name of his company. He's in Chicago. He's been helping me for many, a couple years, really. He helped me shoot a lot of things, and he, he's helped me edit, and he's worked with me. Knowing that I didn't have a lot of money, he's helped me out a lot. I'm telling you, I've just been so blessed. I can't even tell you. This, this is really a grassroots effort to get this story done. So many people are involved, and you know why? Because they love Dick Biondi. You hit the right nerve there. I'm telling you, many people love this man so much. They want to do whatever they can to help get this thing on the air. And it's going to be on PBS. We've got four PBS stations across the country so far, and more interested that, wow. that want to run it. Cool. So, yeah. We're going to take a break now for a few minutes to get a few words in from our wonderful sponsors, and we'll be back in just a few minutes. This is the Wild Eye Trillion, Dick Biondi. Roses are red, violets are blue. If I don't read a commercial, the boss says I'm through. Who is that? Is he on something? He, he was an early rebel. How many guys do you know that have been fired 25 times from any job? On top of a beat. People would send him pizzas in the mail. He was there for everybody. Elvis, the Beatles. Dick Biondi was the first guy to play a Beatle record in America. He was in the recording studio when the Stones did Satisfaction. He would break all of our records. Hi, everybody. I'm Dick Biondi. I'm sure you guys are having a lot of fun. In the early 60s, like most teens, I had my radio glued to my ear, listening to rock and roll, teen news, and my favorite disc jockey, Dick Biondi. Dick was more than a DJ. He was our friend. I've always wanted to tell Dick's story and the impact he had on the music and the people of my generation. Because for me and for millions of baby boomers, Dick Biondi was the voice in our cars, the voice under our pillows, and the voice that rocked America. Welcome back to In a Nutshell. I want to focus on my story. I really want to try to get done by Dick's birthday, which is September 13th. So I think he'll be 87 this year. If you so, want him to show up at the premiere, you better get calling with him. I'm telling you, that's what I'm working for. We've been pushing really hard. Well, I so. know that, that money is always an issue in these things. Absolutely. And I know that you undoubtedly could benefit 
if people were, were willing to contribute to this effort? And if people were willing to contribute, how would they do that? Well, it's all on our website, dickbeyondyfilm.com, and uh, there's a page where it says donate, and there's several ways of doing it. It's all uh, tax deductible through uh, Chicago Filmmakers, which is our fiscal sponsor. And um, any size donation is welcome. Okay, so they, yeah. well, do they do it right online, right through the... You can do it right online, and also if you wanted to just mail a check, there's a P.O. box there. That's a good idea. A lot of people prefer that. Yeah, so either way, it's just a click of a button, or it's, a, you know, send a check. Won't you have a beverage with me? Would you like to hear my new song? I would love to hear your new song. My favorite restaurant has a first name. It's D-O-C-K-E-R-S. My favorite restaurant has a second name. It's N-O-R-T-H. Oh, I love to eat here every day. If you ask me, I will say D-O-C-K-E-R-S. N-O-R-T-H is the best. Welcome back to In a Nutshell. At the time of your premiere, do you think he'll come out to the premiere? I sure hope so. <laughs> He's been keeping a low profile, you know, ever since he went off the air, his health... He's got, you know, a few health issues. Um, I hear he's doing well, but he's really keeping a very low profile. So, you know, we don't know. He's not making any public appearances or anything. So we hope so. We really hope so. Sure. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add? You know, it, I just want to say that um, you were the first person to interview me, you and Dolores, way back when I didn't, I was scared to death to even do an interview. Oh, that was our pleasure. <laughs> and you guys had me on, and I mean, I just, I was grateful then, and I'm grateful now for your friendship and for everything that you've done to help me. Uh, you know, and I was watching uh, one of our interviews recently. That was, that was a pretty good interview, I thought. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty happy with it, considering, well, you know, you make people feel quite at ease, and I, uh, you really did. Well, that's good. So, yeah. So, uh, I thank you for that. Oh, you're very welcome. I want to thank you so much for coming to the In a Nutshell TV show. Thank you, you for having me. Our pleasure. It was very informative. Good. And I know that this is going to be a great, great uh, movie. It's going to be excellent. I know you've been working so hard, and we have so many people helping yeah. you and supporting you with that movie effort. Yeah. It's going to be brilliant, and we're just waiting to see it. Thank you. I want to thank my wonderful wife, Dolores, who, for her videographic skills. And I want to thank our audience for tuning in, and I ask you to come back next week. We have another great show lined up for you. You came into my life and blew off the doors like a meteor through a night sky, waking up with new eyes for the first time in a long time.